experience this week. We'll just put his out here so we hear a little bit better. Better? Okay. Um, this workshop's been about design, and everyone in the workshop has really stepped up to the plate. I think a lot of people have raised the bar on their work, uh, which is what my goal was. I really wanted people to set the bar a little bit higher, and I think they have. It's been a really exciting week. I'm really glad to be here. Um, tonight, what I'm going to do is talk about, oh, maybe I move over here. Uh, I'm going to talk about combining watercolor with white gouache. Um, it's a little bit different uh, kind of thing. You might like it. Um, I kind of got stuck. I also have membership in Midwest Watercolor Society as a transparent watercolorist, but I got to the point where I was a little bit feeling that my work was looking like everyone else's that works in transparent watercolor, so looking for something a little bit more personal and a little bit more creative, um, and I found that with my transparent watercolors, I could not paint the kind of paintings that I was actually looking for. So I began a new journey, um, and, and I thought I was going to go into a gouache, um, but I decided I loved my palette. This palette that I'm working with here is a travel palette. It's not the one I work with at home, but I've been teaching classes for a while and developed uh, work, um, my palette. I loved it. I love transparent watercolor. I love my watercolor palette. So I began by just adding one tube of white gouache to my watercolor palette. So everything on this palette is transparent watercolor except for the white, which is white gouache. Um, so there, uh, many of these are Holbein colors. Uh, you, as you know, while watercolor is transparent, it's, they're not equally transparent within the tube. So uh, I went then to search out all the uh, opaque watercolors that I could find. You know, cerulean blue is opaque and yellow ochre is opaque and cat, all the cats are opaque. So uh, Holbein also makes a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, and so many of those are on my palette. Um, and so I do a, um, I, I work this way now. Uh, it's kind of a layered effect. Um, and I'm going to just show, it, show you how I put it together. These are very, my paintings are pretty labor intensive because they're built. They're, they are, I, I can't rely on washes any longer. I'm working stroke by stroke. So they are built layer by layer. But I'm just going to show you uh, a real quick, uh, I'm gonna, I have a finished, sample painting here so you'll see what I'm working towards as I'm working and just ask me questions as I go. Anything that you want to know just ask. Um, uh, I'm going to, in, in terms of the people in my class, um, we've been working a lot with design and uh, we work through shape uh, compositions, working with uh, trying to create a really well structured composition of shapes in the rectangle and then also a, a uh, creating value patterns. Uh, value patterns, in, oh, I wanted to show you my photo. Uh, I took this photo, in a, and I'm, I'm for my class because I need to do something quick. Uh, this is not something that I normally paint, but this was just for a demonstration. Um, this, I took this photo, and I said to myself, how many ways are there to create a painting? And just with the value pattern alone, I said to my class, you know, you can look at this painting in terms of, do I want to do a dark against light? Do I want to do a light against dark? Do I want to do an alternating value pattern, which creates flat? Do I want to show three-dimensional form and modeling? All these are different ideas. I mean, I need to know before I begin what I want to say in my painting. But there are many, many ways, many, many approaches. Uh, here we have just a flat home value approach. Uh, an emphasis on uh, painting a feeling of light. And this one is just kind of a fun kind of uh, play around with light and dark values. So uh, in my class, in our class this week, we did, I did this one, which was, uh, the, and I should have brought it, but I forgot, the dark or the light against dark. The one I'm going to do today, I'm going to attempt to, I'm going to start. I'm never going to finish it, even though it's small. Um, is this emphasis on two-dimensional flat shapes and just uh, creative patterns and, and just a creative kind of version using that photo as a uh, jumping off place. I am, I'm just going to, I'm going to try to put together, reconstruct that painting. 
for you. So as you can see, that painting, the, the value pattern is this. Those are the colors. You see it's opaque. It's, uh, it looks more like an oil painting than it does a watercolor, but it's watercolor. It gives it a whole different feeling. Uh, there are a lot of opaques being done in the national shows now. Transparent watercolor, I really think he has a hard time competing anymore because watercolor has really gone in different directions. So uh, this might be something you'd like to try. Okay, and I'm going to talk about the difference between transparent and, and opaque as I go to. I, I did this drawing first. I usually do a, a transfer, a drawing on with graphite, and then uh, I go over the drawing with the, another outline uh, and so that I don't lose my um, drawing as soon as I start painting. And I usually... Uh, I'm starting transparent because this, this method works um, well and I paint around the whites even though I have white to paint with. Um, I know that I'm going to keep those, I want those uh, lights pretty light, so I'm just going to paint around that. You may say, why don't you just put in a violet drawing would dissolve when I did this, so I needed to have a, a, some sort of a staining color to uh, hold it. <coughs> it is a funny thing, you would think, why doesn't that lift? that, you know, I haven't lifted off my dry, which kind of amazes me sometimes. How come that doesn't dissolve in there? But it doesn't. As long as it's dry, I can paint my, uh, my uh, wash over it. I already, this, when I did this, of course, I didn't know what I was going to get. My paintings are done. The colors are discovered in the paintings themselves uh, in an approach that I call uh, improvisation. I mean, I truly don't know what I'm doing. I look for the painting, uh, look at the painting, Put colors down. If I like it, it stays. If I don't like it, I change it. With this approach, I have the ability to change as much as I want. I can cover, um, I can paint dark to light. Um, I can paint light to dark if I want. And I can paint uh, muted colors over bright colors. Uh, I can lift things off and start all over again. So I, and which is one of the reasons I wanted to work this way because I've, in transparent watercolor, it just, you know, you, once. It was for me the way I was painting, you know, you better get it right the first time, and I really didn't like that was not working for me. So uh, here is kind of a hunt and peck search uh, kind of thing going. So this is uh, Horizon Blue. It's transparent watercolor. I'm kind of building up towards the yellow green turquoise kind of thing going on there. Have you painted in oil or acrylic? I actually, a um, hundred years ago, I'm getting shoe polish, and it, you can get mud very, very quickly. So I want to kind of build up a, a layer underneath, and then put the more uh, final <laughs> colors on top. It's a building process, much like oils. It's a stroke by stroke, rather than a wash uh, kind of effect. I'd like to start getting things, you know, moving around on the whole, um, here, I think there, I, I can, I can lift in here if I want to get back to white. Especially on this surface. This, this ability to get back, it depends on the surface really more than anything. I, I can do this because this is a hot press surface, and you know how much liftability you would have on a, a cold, pr uh, cold press or rough. What I, I'm going to do here is uh, lift out that, some of those and go back in with red. Although I did, that, I did do that demo very quickly because I knew I didn't have a lot of time. Uh, but you know everything, it's always different. So you see, I started, and what happens too is early on, this, uh, uh, even though it's a hot press surface, is fairly absorbent, and the paint does sink in. The more paint is layered on top, the less sinking in it happens. So again, that's why it's sort of a building uh, process. 
the second time in, it starts sitting on top of the paint rather than sinking in the paper. I'm going to try some of those darts. I probably wouldn't do this at home uh, this quick, but in an attempt to get something that, that I can relate to here that resembles what's going on there. What color is that? Well, it was supposed to be French Ultra, and I picked up Peacock Blue instead. So it's Peacock Blue and Neutral Tint. <laughs> this is sort of an underpainting. I'm going to go back in there, too. But it's just wanted, I just want to get some of the stuff going in quick. I have two palettes. This is a Neutral Tint. And Neutral Tint is a, a wonderful dark... It looks like this. Can you see it? Looks like black, uh, but it's neutral. It's like it's not like ivory black. Ivory black has soot in it. Ivory black is granulating. Ivory black is a little hard to work with, um, and it's warm. Ivory black has a lot of warmth in it. This color, neutral tint, is neutral black. So it's neither. It's supposedly neither warm nor cool, but uh, it is a little bit cool because it makes beautiful violets. But it's, I use it as a black, and it's a really nice color to, mi to use to mix with if you want to use a black to darken your colors. It works really well. I use a lot of it. Now, you use the same process when you paint a full sheet? Yes, and you can just imagine. With that brush? Little, yes, this is my biggest brush. Ooh, nice. <laughs> yeah, I went from huge washes to this kind of approach. Yeah, you can't, you cannot, that's one of the disadvantages of this, you can't, you can no, I can no longer rely on the perfect medium. But you see it gets um, thicker, um, the paint is starting to sit on top of paint now instead of sinking into the uh, board. I'm getting an actual stroke that is sitting down that I'm creating. <coughs> the uh, danger with this approach is using too much water. If you use too much water, it will all uh, melt together and, and make mud quick. So you really could paint right out of the tube. It is right out of the tube. I right? know it. Basically. Yeah. So that, what do you think is really attractive about the brush strokes? Has there been any specific thing you've seen that you really thought was neat? Yeah, it's me. Mm -hmm. Not the paint. It's not, I see, because it is the flattened one, the most flattened version. Talked about why you didn't do it in oil. Why don't you do it in acrylic? Yeah. I didn't do it. I don't work in acrylic. Uh, is that you, Cal? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I know the answer, but okay. I thought someone else was doing it. Okay. <laughs> That's because the of the water sol solubility factor here. Um, I in my watercolors did a lot of lifting, this sort of thing, and scrubbing with toothbrush on on uh, you know the. Uh, uh, rougher surfaces, um, so I and I like that. It was kind of it's kind of my natural thing, you know, to just kind of lift it out if I didn't like what was there. Um, so I wanted to keep that. And what acrylic? Once you put acrylic down, it's permanent. That's it. You can't lift it. Also, you, I don't know if you can see, but I am melting color into color here, and I couldn't do that with acrylic either. It once it's down, it's there. It's like plastic. It's it's you know coated, and you can't move it. Here, I can melt color into color. <laughs> kind of going from bright to dull here. Setting up the color. What percentage of time do you work big and small? I mean, do you want mainly work small and then only work 10% of the time and large? I used to always work 22 by 30, always, and um, 
I don't know why I started working small. And I had to force my, I think it was for, I, I had a, one time we had in our group, the Chelsea Painter group I belong to, had gallery owner come in and, and say that the small painting sell the large and the large sell the small. And I thought, well, that, that sounds like a good idea is to have a variety of sizes for people to buy. But I had to force myself to paint small. I could not paint small. But once I did, I then I started, I love painting small now. So I would, and this process works, is easier small because it is so time, you know, it takes so much time. Um, but I, now what I do is for uh, shows, jury shows, I do them large. So I'll do maybe one, two, or three large full sheet uh, a year. Um, and then the rest are small. Like, does this look weird? <laughs> I didn't get weird enough yet. <laughs> I do I like to play with edges. I do a lot of edge stuff. Uh, for like, and you know, and I do some outlining and I just am real interested in putting together an interesting surface here. It doesn't have to look like here. I'm not really interested. I don't, I'm not looking at this. I'm looking at that and that. And at home, that, you can, and this doesn't do me any good. This was for the original, you know, get a drawing in kind of thing. I feel the pressure. Everybody's yawning. <laughs> no, we, we typically take a break around eight. So whatever is a good point for you. You can take a break now. Yeah. Whatever you know. I'll just keep painting. The more I get done, the better off you are. Go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have 15, 15 minutes, and we'll get back at 10, 10 minutes past eight. Yeah. Okay.